starting. So welcome everybody. Um, as I as I mentioned to you before we met, I'm no longer recording on this microphone. I'm recording on this microphone. So hopefully the audio will be a little bit better. Uh, this microphone did a good job, but I will tuck it behind my ear. I guess that just looks kind of weird though, right? I don't know. I don't know what I can do. If I stick it out here, it looks kind of stupid, doesn't it? So I'll just let it dangle. Okay, um, ba -dump, ba -dump, ba -dump. okay, we're back. And let's uh, first of all, peruse the, peruse the uh, homework. And uh, let me put that screen up here. And I gotta put this thing down, okay. And I will share my screen. Okay, uh, let's see. Do we have any homework uh, this week? This is uh, this is March, right? So we have something which is due March fourth, which is on Thursday. So we'll we'll gather questions here. I started to mess around with this, but decided I, I shouldn't. Um, let's see. I want to delete that row. So here's one of the things I want you to do. I want you to convince yourself that this transformation on a random variable is real. So I want you to choose, in, in this example, I want you to choose some sort of g of x that will allow you to transform, that will allow you to transform a uniform random variable into an arbitrary random variable. And you can choose like minus the log of x, which does, does an exponential. That's probably the easiest one. If you can be a little bit more creative than that, I would appreciate it, but certainly that will work. Then uh, I want you to use uh, either Excel or some other sort of uh, random number generator and generate a whole bunch of random numbers which are uniform. And then I would like you to, just to assure yourself they're uniform, to plot a to plot a histogram of all of those numbers which are uniformly distributed. Then I would like you to make the transformation into a second column or a second vector, if you will, of y is equal to g of x. So if you do the log, you take the log or minus the log of all of them or whatever. And then once, once you do that, I would like you to make a histogram of that. Now that histogram should coincide, once you normalize it, that is you make it an area of one, that histogram should, should coincide with the, the y is equal to g of x transformation that you did. So you should be able to plot a f sub y, and below that you should plot the uh, histogram, the normalized histogram, and it should follow the curve really, really closely. Just like the uniform histogram will follow a square, or a rectangle pretty pretty closely. The new one should follow that histogram very, very closely. And I think this is a good exercise to go through for everybody because it will convince you that indeed there is a transformation on a random variable and you are getting that probability density function. It's really kind of, uh, kind of cool to see. So does that make sense? Okay, good. And it's something which is not that big of a deal. Uh, so the, the other one I would like you to do is through some of the work that we did in characteristic functions, what is the distribution, I'm, I'm looking at here, what is the distribution when the random variables have uh, the following random, when the random variables from the following random variables are added? So suppose you had a six geometric random variables all with the given parameter P. Uh, you add those up. I want you to look at the characteristic function. What do you do for the characteristic function? You multiply them together when you add the random variables, right? That's what we decided. So multiply those characteristic functions. Look at the resulting characteristic functions and then look at your table of characteristic functions and their corresponding random variables and see what roughly you can, uh, uh, you, you can talk about. Um, same thing with six Bernoulli random numbers, all with a parameter P, six Pascal negative binomial random variables, all with a parameter P, but different, but different R's, different R's. You remember the negative binomial random variable is, is R people playing Russian roulette. So if R is equal to seven, you have seven peoples playing Russian roulette and the first one spins until the bullet fires. The second one spins till the bullet fires. 
the seventh one spins until the bullet fires. You add up all of those spins, and that is the random variable that you're talking about. So it's a repeated, um, it's a repeated geometric random variable. And then I'd like you to look, this is really interesting. Three Gaussians, all with different means and variances. What happens there? You'll find out that you do get a Gaussian. Gaussians are hard to kill, man. They are just uh, very difficult to kill. And if you have a Gaussian and you add to a Gaussian, you get another Gaussian. You change the mean, you change the variance. And the question is, is how do you change the mean and variance? You might have seen these questions before asked in a different context, but I'd like you to look at it from this uh, perspective. And then I would like you to look at this general problem. What is the mean and variance when the characteristic function is, as you can see, an exponential uh, raised to the magnitude of omega raised to the nth power. So therefore, if uh, n is equal, big N is equal to two, that's a Gaussian. If big N is equal to one, that is a Laplace. Uh, no, I guess it's a Cauchy for big N is equal to one. And then e to the minus j omega is just a phase factor in the characteristic function that shifts things around. Okay, so I'd like you to do this. These are actually very easily, e easily done if you know how to do them. So any questions on these at all? Have you had a chance to look at these? I hope you have because we're supposed to discuss them today. I was wondering if for um, adding the, the distributions, uh, you, you do the the multiplication in the of the characteristic functions. Yes. I was wondering if we will have to do the inverse uh, to come no, back. No, you no, you don't no. have to do the inverse because Fourier transforms are unique, and therefore, if you have a, a if you have a characteristic function that looks like a Gaussian then it's a Gaussian. The characteristic function looking like the characteristic of, of a Gaussian is enough to know that it's Gaussian. No, you don't need to invert it at all because the, the forward Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform are all unique. So you don't have to worry about that. Everything is unique, okay? No, no inversion. No inversion is needed. It's looking at the, um, it's looking at the actual characteristic functions, if you will, as the uh, measure of the probability density function. Okay. okay. So there's there. Okay. So there's no questions on this, by the way, I think it'd be kind of fun to kind of look at the following situation. Let me go ahead and share my screen here and show you what we've been doing. And let's see if my little pin works. Ah, my little pin works. Okay. We all started out and we all know and love the probability density function, right? Probability density function is our friend. If we go this way and we integrate, we get the what? The characteristic function, correct? Or no, the cumulative distribution function, correct? If we differentiate this, Whoops, I guess, yeah, I, that should be an X, shouldn't it? If we differentiate the, the cumulative distribution function, we get the probability density function, correct? If we Fourier transform this, if we Fourier transform this, we get the characteristic function. If we inverse Fourier transform, the characteristic function, we get the probability density function, correct? And then lastly, if we take the logarithm of this, we get the second characteristic function, right? If we take the log of this, we get the second characteristic function, or if we go backwards, what's the inverse of the log? That's an EXP, right? An EXP an e to the x sort of operation. So here we have four different representations of a random variable x. All of these are trying to figure out what the random variable x looks like in terms of a probability density function. Notice that there are four different representations here. 
each of these representations is accessible from any of the other any of the other representations. You give me any one of these, and I can find the other three, right? So they're all just three, uh, all just equivalent, not equivalent, but they're different representations of the same random variable. And as we look at one, there is no reason that given one of them, given the second characteristic function, for example, you can figure out the characteristic function, you can inverse Fourier transform and find the probability density function, then you can integrate to find the cumulative distribution function. So given any one of these, you can access the other ones. So expanding on Glauco's um, uh, idea, if we get this, and this has a specific form, that specific form already assumes the, what the random variable is. We don't have to inverse transform to, uh, in, in, order to um, in order to verify that, okay? So hopefully that helps a little bit. Does that make sense? Just four different, four different characterizations of the same exact random variable. Okay, with that, uh, if there's no more questions, let's go into the lecture and talk about some of these kind of cool tail inequalities. Um, so let me share my screen again. So we're still on the topic of functions of a random variable. And these are kind of interesting functions of a random variable, if you will. One is by Markov. And these are inequalities. And we will see here for the first time uh, what some of these parameters mean. We see, I have an intuitive, I have an intuitive feeling for what the mean of a random variable is. That's where if you cut the, if you cut the probability density function out of a piece of wood, that's where it would balance. That's the center of mass of the probability density function. The variance, which is the second moment minus the square of the first moment is a little bit more elusive. That supposedly is a measure of the dispersion or how much the probability density function is spread out. However, that's not intuitive to me from the definition. And we'll find out, not in this one, not in Markov's inequality, but from Chebyshev's inequality, that indeed this is, uh, this is what happens, that the, variance, that the variance is how much things are spread out. So let's start with Markov's inequality. First of all, Markov's inequality is only applicable for probability density functions, which are in, in the lingual of signal processing causal. That means they are equal to zero for um, for x less than zero. So that's what that u sub x is. That's a unit step. If you do have this unit step, then Markov's inequality says this, that the probability that x is greater than a is less than or equal to x bar over a. Let me give you an example. Let's look at a simple example of f uh, sub x of x equal to I'm even going to take out all the parameters, e to the minus x times a unit step in x. Is that OK? So that's a simple probability density function that is causal, since it's 0 for negative time. Um, the mean of this, if you worked it out, would be equal to 1. That's the mean of this random variable. So what is the probability? that x is greater than or equal to a. Well, that's equal to the integral from a to infinity of e to the minus x dx, right? I should, should have made this a typewriter a. Is that right? So this is equal to minus e to the minus x from zero to infinity, no, from a to infinity, I'm sorry, from a to infinity, which is equal to e to the minus a. Correct? Now, according to Markov's inequality, the probability that x is greater than a, in this case, we said 
e to the minus a. Now a here clearly, by the way, I'm making two types of a's here, right? A is the same thing as a. Uh, the probability that x is greater than a is equal to e to the minus a. We just derived that down here. The mean is equal to one over a. So the question is, is e to the minus a always less than one over a? For a greater than zero. Well, let's take a look at this. If we have, if we do this as a function of a, e to the minus a looks like this. Right? And one over a, one over a looks like this. And we do see that e to the minus a is always less than one over a for this specific example. Is that okay? So therefore we see that for this simple special case of Markov's inequality, it holds. But the point of Markov's inequality is this holds no matter what the probability density function is. And we can see that on the next, uh, here's the proof. First of all, the mean is defined as what? The integral from x is equal to minus infinity to infinity, right? Or x is equal to zero to infinity because x does not go negative here because of our assumption of the probability density function. So we're gonna divide up this integral in from x is equal to zero to a and then from uh, x is equal to a to infinity. So we're just dividing up the integral. Now, in both of these cases, notice that the integrand, if we talk about values that are always greater than zero, this integrand is always greater than zero, isn't it? Right? The integrand is always greater than zero. Why? Because x lies between zero and infinity, and f sub x, the density function, is always non-negative. So therefore, if we drop off one of these integrals, we're dropping off something which is positive. So we're gonna drop off one of these integrals. We're gonna drop off this integral. Uh, the integral from x is equal to zero to a of this integrand is always gonna be positive. We're gonna drop it off. And what happens when we drop that off? The integrand becomes smaller, doesn't it? It becomes the integral from x is equal to a to infinity. Now, this is kind of, this is the little tricky part here. You notice that over this integral, that the lower limit is a, correct? The lower limit is a, and the upper limit is infinity. So over this interval, over this interval x is always going to be what? x is always going to be greater than or equal to a, correct? Over this integral. This is the little tricky part. X is always going to be greater than A over this interval. So if that's the case, we can replace the X, since the X is always going to be greater than A, we can substitute the value of A here and continue this integration, this inequality, which even gets uh, more, uh, the integrand gets smaller, correct? And so at this point, we can take this a outside the integral sign. And if we take this a outside the integral sign, we get a, and then what's left in the integration is the probability that x is greater than a. So therefore, this proves it. The first part, the expected value of x is greater than or equal to a times the probability that x is greater than a. This, this is true for all probability density functions that are zero for negative argument. This is kind of interesting, right? And we showed that on the previous slide with the exponential. And you can, you can apply this to any probability density function that you like. And indeed, this comes out to be the case.
Well, Markov was a student of uh, Chebyshev, and Chebyshev also had a, a inequality. And guess what they call it? Chebyshev's inequality. Now, if you're a really good scientist or mathematician, you never name anything after yourself. It looks like you got a lot of ego if you do something like that. But um, uh, so Chebyshev didn't name it after himself, but I guess he was indeed the discoverer. And this is Chebyshev's inequality. And instead, you notice that um, Markov's inequality had to do with the first moment, had to do with the expected value of X. Chebyshev's inequality has to do with the variance of X, has to do with the variance of X. Now, it's probably easier to look at this for a zero mean random variable. If it's zero mean, that if, is if X bar is equal to zero, then the probability that X is greater than A is less than or equal to the variance of X. over a squared. Now what's the probability? What is this probability equal to? Well, here, here is a density function down here. We have a density function down here. Here is x bar. So we're centering everything around x bar, the mean of the probability density function. And what is the probability that x minus x bar is equal to a? Uh, that, is, that is this probability here. That is the probability in the orange area, correct? That's the probability that x bar x minus x bar is a. That is less than or equal to the variance of uh, the variance of x divided by a squared. So this is an upper bound. This is an upper bound for this area here, if you will. So what happens if the variance gets bigger? If the variance gets bigger, this upper bound gets bigger, doesn't it? If the variance gets bigger, the upper bound gets bigger. In other words, if the variance gets bigger, we have something, we, we know that we have, we have a bigger variance. We have a probability density function that kind of looks like this, right? And as things get bigger, guess what happens to this area? This is the upper bound for the probability that area gets bigger also. So as the variance gets bigger, the area under the tails gets bigger and we can see that the variance, this is the first time that I think that I see the variance as a measure of dispersion, that the variance gets, uh, the variance is getting bigger and bigger. So that upper bound gets bigger and bigger, which means that the density function gets more and more spread out. So this is the idea behind the Chebyshev inequality. The Chebyshev inequality follows, for, follows a proof actually very close to the Markov inequality. In fact, you can show the Chebyshev inequality from the Markov inequality, but we're going to do it from scratch. Uh, here's, the, here, here's, the, uh, here's the derivation. It starts out with the definition of the variance of x. This is the definition of the variance of x. And we can divide this integral just like before into uh, integrations from, well, before we're integrating from minus infinity to infinity. And we notice that the integrand is always positive, right? X minus X bar is always positive. F sub X is always non-negative. So we can assure that the integrand is always non-negative, right? The integrand is always non-negative. So if you knock out a portion of the integrand, you're going to make this integration smaller. So we're going, to, we're going to integrate not from minus infinity to infinity, but we're going to take the x bar here. And we're going to integrate from x bar minus a to x bar plus a. So that's an interval of 2a. So this is, uh, and we are just going to integrate over the tails. So we're going to integrate from minus infinity up to this point, x bar minus a. And then we're going to integrate from this point out to infinity, which is, um, which is x plus x bar plus a. 
and we've dropped out the middle, and we know that the middle contribution is going to be non-negative. So therefore, this integrand has to get smaller, doesn't it? It has to get smaller. Now, both of these can be combined into a single integration, and that is x minus x bar squared is greater than a squared. So we're integrating over x bar, uh, x minus x bar is greater than or equal to a squared. So you can take these values and you can concatenate them into this single integral. And that is equal to, uh, oh, okay, into this integral. So therefore we have taken these limits and we have placed it as a single limit, if you will, if you will, on the integration. Now we notice that this limit is this result it's x minus x bar. But look, we have something happening back from the Markov inequality. We have x minus x bar. Notice the x minus x bar appears both in the integration and in the integrand. The x minus x bar appears in the limits as well as the integrand. And the integrand says that x, bar, x minus x bar is always greater than a squared. So this thing is always greater than a squared. Why? Because that's the only thing we're considering in the integration. So we have this integral and then the a squared, you can see the similar sort of pattern from the, uh, from the Markov inequality. This a squared can be factored outside and we're left with the a squared. And then the integral inside is the probability that x minus x bar is greater than a. So therefore we have proven the Chekhov inequality that the variance of x is greater than or equal to, variance of x is greater than or equal to a squared times the problem times this probability that we're shown here. So I will be asking you as a homework, as I did for the uh, Markov inequality, is to show this for uh, some sort of Chebyshev inequality. Take any probability density function that you want and show that this inequality is applicable. Notice that there are some implicit assumptions in this, uh, in, in this theorem. Anybody know, anybody identify these implicit assumptions? Is one assumption that the distribution is symmetric about the mean? No, no, that, that's a good try, but no, that isn't the assumption I'm looking for. And that is not an assumption that's applicable here. It's certainly applicable to when it is symmetric about the mean, but it's also applicable to skewed distributions also. The assumption is, anybody else want to go? The assumption is, is that X bar and the variance of X exist. And we have seen there are probability density functions that really don't have a well-defined X bar. That's the Cauchy, right? Uh, and, and the Pareto, in some, in some cases, has an infinite, mean, uh, infinite first moment. And we've also shown that the Cauchy doesn't have a variance. So therefore, the idea of a mean and variance doesn't apply to here. So your, your underlying probability density function has to have a finite mean. It has to have a finite variance. And only then can you apply it. That's exactly the same thing, of course, for Markov's inequality. There is the assumption that the mean is finite. And there are, there are random variables, such as the Pareto, under certain cases, that has an infinite mean. So those are the assumptions. But if you can, if you can make those assumptions, you get a lot of mileage out of Markov's inequality and, um, and uh, Chebyshev's inequality. Any questions at all? Okay, good. I think what we're going to do now is skip to the next topic. And the next topic is going to be multi-random variables. This is something that you've probably seen before in one way or another. We're going to go through the elementary part of it relatively quickly and get to the, some of the more interesting stuff. But we need to do the review as of first. But this is a good time for a refresh of my coffee. Keep my palate cleansed so that I can talk more clearly. OK, 
Okay, so. So here are two dimensional random variables and we'll talk about this quickly. Um, I think I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but there are, there are certain backward tribes that can only count to three and they go one, two, three, and they can't comprehend above three. So they say many. And many of these tribes, when they had shepherds, for example, couldn't count above three. So what they did when they were counting their flocks, they simply gathered stones one for each sheep. Oh, there's a sheep. Okay, there's another sheep, another rock. There's another sheep, another rock. And then at the end of the day, they were able to say, okay, here's a rock. Okay, got that sheep, got this sheep, got this sheep. And they were able to do a one-to-one -one correspondence, but they could not comprehend about the number three. They just went one, two, three, many. Uh, we are no better than that in terms of a number of cases. Uh, the first of which is the idea of dimensions. We can only comprehend of three spatial dimensions. Some, if they stretch their minds, might be able to comprehend four dimensions, four spatial dimensions. Can you comprehend four spatial dimensions? If you took my class of multidimensional signal processing, you should be able to, because we went up to four and five. In my course of multidimensional uh, signal processing, we literally played four-dimensional tic-tac-toe and showed how we could extend that into five-dimensional tic-tac-toe. So you've heard of three-dimensional chess, that's nothing. Think of five-dimensional tic-tac-toe. And we showed a way that you can literally play five-dimensional tic-tac-toe. So if you're interested in learning that, then you need to take the course on multidimensional uh, signal processing. So that is something we can't comprehend above and beyond three, um, three dimensions. Another thing we can't comprehend above is um, um, levels of infinity, the, the, the smallest infinity according to George Cantor. And the, infinity is not the sideways eight, okay? The sideways eight is something called increasing without bound. And you can have something increasing without bound and it's still finite. I don't care how much it increases, it's still not infinite. So Cantor dismissed with that idea, went to the idea of the existence of the actual infinite, the number of counting numbers, for example, and he called it Aleph not, Aleph sub zero. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then he showed that there were bigger infinities. A bigger infinity than Aleph not was the number of points on a line. The number of points on the line between zero and one is greater than the infinite number of points of integers. It's a bit, and it's provably, it's provably bigger. And Cantor showed it just by an ingenious proof that it was bigger. And then there's, a, uh, there, there, there's an infinity bigger than that. And that would be, for example, all the scribbles that you could do on a piece of paper. Every scribble, every combination of dots and points and areas that you could, you could shade in. And the set of all those scribbles is Aleph 2. The set of infinite points on a line is Aleph 1. There's Aleph 2. And it turns out you can, you can generate these, these supersets by taking the set of all subsets. So if you take the set of all subsets of the counting numbers, you get Aleph 1. If you take the set of all subsets of Aleph 1, you get Aleph 2. If you take the set of all subsets of Aleph 2, you get Aleph 3. But here's something interesting. There is nothing that I have seen, nor that I can comprehend, nor I think that any human can comprehend, which is an example of Aleph 2. That is uh, an, an infinity bigger than Aleph 2. Aleph 3 is beyond, beyond comprehension. It's kind of like it's, um, it's something that we, yeah, we just, we just can't comprehend, almost like a fourth or fifth spatial dimension. So we're not, we're not a lot smarter than these tribesmen that could only count to three, right? One, two, three, many, because that's beyond our comprehension. But like the tribesmen with the stones, we can do things which extend this idea to higher dimensions. So we can, we can uh, talk about higher dimensions in a abstract way by relating to what happens in the lower dimensions. And that's what we're doing. Now, why did I talk about this? Because we've spent a lot of time with one dimensional random variables. Now we're gonna spend a lot of time with two dimensional random variables. Then we're gonna to go to the case of an infinite number of random variables. What, an infinite number of random variables? Yes, because we're gonna be dealing with signals that, uh, noise signals, okay? 
And if you think of noise signals, that's a random variable, which is a function of time. So we have a random variable, which is a function of time. That random variable, which is a function of time, sometimes we call noise. Uh, that is a infinite number of random variables. And we have to come to terms of what that means and how we can model them. So we're going to go one to infinity, if you will, or one to multi, and then we'll go to infinity uh, when we talk about stochastic processes and stuff. And uh, we all know what a, what, a prop, what a noise looks like, right? Everybody's seen white noise. Shh. It's just a, it, it's just a, uh, a constant high frequency wiggling around, uh, not high frequency. In fact, it's all frequencies. Uh, but that is literally an infinite number or a, at least a very, very large number of random variables. One for each point in time. You give me a point in time, that gives me a number, right? That number is the random variable assigned to that point in time. You go to another point in time, a little delta before that or after that, that's another random variable. That's another point in time. And that's, uh, um, and, and that's how we generate this infinite or very high number of random variables according to stochastic processes. And we'll, we'll delve into the introduction of stochastic processes anyway, but we're gonna walk before we run by reviewing the two-dimensional random variables. Uh, the two-dimensional random variables are denoted by a cumulative distribution function. You have two random variables that are related in some way. I like to talk about the price of gold and the price of silver. As the price of gold goes up, usually the price of silver goes up. They are random variables which are related in some way. X is the price of gold, Y is the price of silver. And you can characterize this most totally by the cumulative distribution function, which is given here. This is the probability that X, you can see X is less than X and Y is equal to less than there, equal to Y. And this little comma here stands for and. So you read this as and a logical and. So it's a probability that big X is less than little x and big Y is less than or equal to little y. And there are certain some things that happen. Here's the definition. This is, this is the definition of the probability density function. Because it is a probability, probabilities have to lie between zero and one. So we know that the cumulative distribution function has to lie between zero and one because probabilities lie between zero and one. If we look at infinity, you can think of this as a two-dimensional plot. Here's X, here's Y. And every single point on here, we assign a, a, a number to. So for this value of X and this value of Y, we assign a value of one half. And so every point gets assigned a number. And you can think of these as kind of like landscapes. You're all familiar with contour plots. You can think of contour plots. Well, this is a, this is a bad example for a contour plot for a probability or a cumulative distribution function, but you can think of it as a contour plot. Uh, for a cumulative distribution function, here is uh, something that's interesting. If you have a cumulative distribution function, and you go out to infinity. You go out to infinity. Uh, what is the probability density function here? Well, that's the probability that X is less than infinity or and, and that Y is less than infinity. This is always true. X and Y are both less than or equal to infinity. So this is always one. So if you go out here asymptotically, you get one. In fact, in all of the boundaries here, all of the boundaries up to, but not including the axes, you're, you're going to get one. So you can go to infinity, infinity here, you can go to infinity, infinity here, and you always get one. What happens if we go to minus infinity? Well, X can never be less than minus infinity and Y can never be less than minus infinity. So this is always equal to zero. So it means that as you go out here in this direction, that we get zero. So those are kind of the boundary conditions. This is kind of the equivalent of the one dimensional case where the, prob the cumulative distribution function is equal to zero for uh, very negative values and asymptotically is to go to one. So this is one D. That's what we would expect the cumulative distribution function to look like. 
And this is the generalization of the idea. It also goes to one and it goes to infinity, but in a little bit different way. Uh, let's look at the probability of fx at infinity. That is, we set the second variable equal to infinity. That's the probability that x is less than or equal to x and the probability that y is less than or equal to infinity. This is always true, right? Y is always less than infinity. So we don't even have to consider this proposition. That's the same thing as the probability that big X is less than or equal to little x. It's the same, it's the same exact thing. So we're left with this distribution, one dimensional distribution, and to call it a name, we call big F sub XY a joint cumulative distribution function. And we, and we uh, whoops, I'm sorry. And we call the one dimensional a marginal distribution function. So the two dimensional is the joint, the one dimensional is the marginal. Two dimensional is the joint, one dimensional is the marginal. What happens if X and Y are independent? Well, don't forget this little comma here corresponds to the logical operation of and. And if we have X is less than or equal to little x and Y is less than or equal to little y, well, if they're independent, the definition of independent is these are the product of the individual probabilities, right? If they are independent, if they're independent of the, um, if they're independent of each other, then they can be written as the product of the marginals. So we get simply this result here. And so we have the, uh, the marginals and the joints and the marginal is the product of the joints. Is that right? No, the joints are the product of the marginals. I said that backwards. The joints are the product of the marginals, if they're independent. So uh, what would be an example of independent random variables? How about if, um, I don't know, X was the price of silver and uh, Y was the time that you went to bed last night. Uh, hopefully they're totally independent of each other. So you could treat these as independent random variables because one has nothing to do with the other. But if you talk about the price of gold and the price of silver, yeah, there's going to be a relationship there. They're going to be related to each other. Now, here is the equivalent of the strictly increasing. Remember that we had for the cumulative distribution function. That the cumulative distribution function was strictly increasing, right? We're going to generalize that now into two dimensions. Uh, they're still a strictly increasing, but it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different than we saw before. Whoa, what happened here? I guess I hit a button that I shouldn't have. Okay. Uh, and this is the concept. The cumulative distribution function, if you take a step down the x-axis, delta x, or you take a step down the y-axis, if you take a step down the x-axis, or you take a step down the y-axis and delta x and delta y are both considered positive, then you have a bigger number than you did when you started with. So for example, here is a, uh, here is after you've taken a step down the x-axis and a step down the y-axis. And this is a plot, if you will, of the cumulative distribution function of two dimensions. This is where you started from. And from where you started from to where you ended up, you're going uphill. So it turns out that no matter which way you go, if you go positive in the x direction, you go positive in the y direction, or you go positive in the x direction a little bit in the y direction, that you're always going to increase you're always going uphill if you're walking down the positive X or the positive Y axis. This is something which can be proven very simply. Um, and let's see. It can be proven very simply because um, 
this probability is equal to this probability plus whatever you have to do to get bigger. And so it falls out as a very, very simple, uh, simple proof. So the bottom line is with the two-dimensional cumulative distribution function, you're always going upstairs or, or uh, up, up, uphill if you go down the x-axis or the y-axis. Maybe not uphill, but at least you're on level land. You can't go downhill. It's, it's uh, monotonically increasing. Here are some of the properties of two-dimensional distribution functions. We know that in one dimension that <clears throat> We obtain the probability density function by differentiating the cumulative distribution function. Here we have a simpler, a, a simple generalization of that. Uh, we take the uh, partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y. And we can always regain uh, the cumulative distribution from the, from the um, probability density function by an integration. Now, here's a funny thing. I wonder if anybody can ask, answer this. Usually when you integrate something like this, right? In other words, you do an antiderivative, you have you get the result plus a constant, right? Remember from calculus? We don't have this here and we don't have to worry about this here. Does anybody know why? Wouldn't it be because that cumulative distribution function always has to be between zero and one? And so anything that you added would throw it off? Exactly. That's perfect, Theo. That, that, that is exactly the right answer. When we integrate, if we add a constant, that constant might take it below zero or it might raise it above one. But the way that it's written without this constant, make sure that these integrations stay between zero and one. So we don't need that plus a constant that we would normally associate with, uh, with integration. Same thing in the one dimensional case. Now, because, think of this, because the, the cumulative distribution function, here's X and Y, the cumulative distribution function is always going uphill, right? If we go, if we go down the positive axis, either in X or Y, it's always going uphill. So that means that the derivative, since it's always going uphill, is always gonna be greater than or equal to zero. So the probability density function here is always also non-negative. And the total volume of the two-dimensional probability density function is one. Now notice it's a volume, it's a not an area because now we have a density function which is two dimensional. So we have to begin to think in terms of, of two dimensional functions like a, uh, something like this, right? So this is a two dimensional function. This looks like kind of a gumdrop in the XY plane. And it turns out that this is the, if this is a distribution, I'm sorry, a probability density function. If this is a probability density function, then the total volume of this is equal to one, just like the total area of a one dimensional case is equal to one. So that's one of the properties what happens if X and Y are independent? Well, we find out exactly the same thing as we did with the, uh, with the cumulative distribution function. We've shown that if they're independent, the cumulative dif distribution function is equal to the product of the marginals. The joint is equal to the product of the marginals. So therefore we can take this derivative operator, we can operate it on X, then we can operate it on Y, and we simply have the product of the two one-dimensional functions. So again, if they're independent, the joint probability density function is equal to the product of the marginals. 
This is the joint, the two-dimensional. And these down here are referred to as the marginals. I, uh, we, well, we referred to the one-dimensional case as kind of a, um, a one-dimensional probability density function as something that could be thought of in terms of a one-dimensional histogram. Do you recall that? We could do a one-dimensional histogram. We could take an infinite number of samples. And if we had the bin size went very, very close to zero, we would get something approximating the probability density function. Do you recall that? We can do something similar with the two-dimensional cumulative distribution function. Here I have an example of a two-dimensional histogram. And these were trucks which were stopped along I-35, 3,680. 3,681 trucks. They were weighed and measured. I don't know what they do at these stops where they stop you along 35. Anybody know what happens there? I bet they check your logs to make sure you haven't stayed awake too long. And they probably weigh you and check your tonnage. Anyway, this is my hypothesis. We have the tonnage here. So we have the, um, we have the tons. This is how much it weighs and the length of the truck. And I don't know if this is in meters or feet, it doesn't matter for our example, but we accumulate uh, 3,681 and we accumulate this two-dimensional histogram. You'll notice that there used to be people that sat, uh, usually men with little green visors that would sit hunched over a desk all day looking at spreadsheets, but this was before they had spreadsheets where the spreadsheets were on paper. And what they did is that they, uh, they added up everything in this direction, and this was the sum over here. Then they added up all of these numbers, and they wrote the sum over here. And they would have headaches by the end of the day, I'm sure. And then they added them all up, and they got a number. And that number should be the total number of trucks which were tested, which was 3,681. Does that make sense? And then what they did, just to double check, is they added the columns. They added the columns. This was 310. 480 if we added the second column, 436 if we added this column. And guess what happens if you add all of these numbers? You should get the same number, right? So let me ask you this. We have a 2D histogram. We have this length here, which is the marginal. Now notice if we sum along this tonnage, we just get something which is a function of the length, right? In other words, if we had not done the tonnage and we just did the length, these are the numbers we would have come up with. Correct? This is this, this thing in the marginals here is exactly what we would get for a one-dimensional probability density function if we just took the histogram for that one variable for the length. Likewise, down here, if we just took this, this would be the random variable for the tonnage, correct? So this would correspond to, if you will, kind of an F, sub, it's an empirical value of F sub X of Y, X of Y. It is the margin, it is the joint. You notice these are kind of distributions for uh, the F sub Y of Y. And this is kind of a empirical distribution for the F sub X of X. Does that make sense? Notice where these are written. These are written in the margins. These numbers are written in the margins of the piece of paper that these little guys with little green visors used to add up numbers. And this is written in the marginals. So historically, that's the reason that we call the one dimensional probability density functions the marginals, because they're kind of written in the margins, and the overall probability density function, the joint. Isn't that interesting? Now, I put this here, F sub Y, just recognizing that this is an empirical uh, sort of probability density function. You would have to take this and you would have to divide all of these numbers by what in order to make it an empirical probability density function. If we were to make this to an empirical probability density function, we would have to take all of these numbers and divide them by what?
3,681. Yeah, 3,681. Because if we divided all these numbers by 3,681, once we did this, if we added up all the numbers divided by 3,681, we would get one. Because the total sum of this, all of these probabilities has to be equal to one. So that's how we get the probability density function out of the, um, out of a two-dimensional, out of a two-dimensional uh, histogram. So we have a length, uh, a length marginal and a weight marginal, as in 1D normalized histograms are empirical probability density functions. That's how you would estimate the probability density functions. Notice in statistics, we have a department of statistics here at Baylor. If you're interested in statistics, you always are estimating. You add a bunch of numbers and divide by n, what are you estimating? That's the average. You're estimating the mean of the probability density function, right? Uh, so here we're, we're estimating the probability density function as best we can by the data that we are given. And again, see why they're called marginals, because those marginals are written in the margins. I'm going to skip this part. This is really fascinating, but I think that we're going to, in terms of time, we're going to, um, we're going to skip that. Here are the properties of two-dimensional probability density functions. Suppose that you had some uh, probability density function here, and this density function had uh, was was represented by some contour plot. You can think of that gumdrop that I had previously, right? So you have a two-dimensional probability density function, and that is what f sub x is, right? And you would like to find out the probability that a random variable X and Y are within this area. So this might be the probability density function joint between gold and silver. And you look at the price of gold and silver today, and it's here. This is X is gold, Y is silver. You look at the price now, uh, and you look at the price tomorrow, and it's here. And you look at the price here uh, the next day, and it's here. You look at the price the next day, and it's here. What's the probability that if you just have one observation that it is going to be in this pre-specified area A? It turns out that it is, a again, a probability density function. Remember, we talked about density functions. If you have a mass density function, you, you integrate over it, you get mass. If you have a, um, a charge density function, you integrate it over, you get, you get charge. If you have a probability density function and you integrate over it, you get probability. And that is exactly what we get here. The probability that, the, uh, that X and Y, your random variable, lies within A is equal to the area of the probability density function over this area A. So this is exactly the same as in one dimension. If we have a one dimensional density function and we want the probability that the random variable lies with this in this integral A, interval A, it's equal to the integral of the density function over that area, correct? That's the same thing we have here, except it's the integral O in two dimensions. But this can turn out to be a very nice very nice tool to do a bunch of different uh, characteristic functions, not carry, I'm sorry, a, a bunch of different operations. Here, by the way, I just showed on the right, this is a, another view. This is a slice out of the probability density function and it's the volume, it's the volume under that slice, if you will. Let's uh, look for, for example, at the probability that X is less than or equal to X. That is, here's the, here's the, here's the challenge. We have a two-dimensional X and Y probability density function. But we're not interested in Y. We're just interested in X. We want to get rid of all the information about Y. How do we do that? We just want the probability that X is less than or equal to X. When we go down to this two-dimensional density function, this is the uh, F sub X of Y, if you will. And what we're going to do is we're going to integrate, we're gonna integrate the X variable from minus infinity to X. So this is the probability 
that big X is less than or equal to little X. And then we don't care what Y is. So we're gonna integrate from minus infinity to infinity. So we obtain this result and now this is the result. This is the, uh, this is the marginal distribution function. So how do we get to the probability density function? We differentiate this, right? Do you remember what the derivative of the integral from x of g of x is? Make that a dummy variable. This is the, this is the, this is an operator. This integrates, this differentiates. If you integrate, then you differentiate, you're undoing the integration. This is just G of X, isn't it? That's just G of X. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to differentiate. We're gonna differentiate. And when we differentiate this integral, we're going to take this first dummy variable and we're going to make it into an X because we're differentiating an integration. And we are going to be left with the integral from minus infinity to infinity of G of, uh, of, the, of the distribution function. You know what? This is exactly like the histogram. This is a two-dimensional function here. We're not interested in that two-dimensional function. We're only interested in the one-dimensional function, right? That's all we're interested in. So what are we going to do? We're going to integrate from y is equal to minus infinity to infinity. We're gonna integrate along this line and whatever is the area under this line, we're gonna give a number to here. Doesn't this look like adding up the columns in that histogram? It's exactly the same thing as adding up the columns in the histogram, except now we're doing it on a continuum basis. And so we do that for every slice through this probability density function. And we add up all of the columns or integrate all the columns and we get the corresponding marginal. So this is a generalization of the idea of that histogram that we that, that we integrate that we get rid of all the elements in the um, we get rid of all the elements in the column by adding them up and that gives us the marginal. Another way to think about it, this is a good way to think about it. If you want to get rid of a variable, if you want to get rid of y, you integrate it out. If you want to get rid of y, you integrate it out. And this is equivalent again to adding the columns of the cumulative uh, distribution function. Does that make sense? So we've seen the first application of this idea, a uh, very, very useful idea in terms of uh, cumulative distribution functions and stuff you can do with them. Let's look at something else here. You have two probabilities. Uh, say the price of silver is X, the price of gold is Y and you want to figure out the price of silver, what, what's the probability that the price of silver is greater than the price of gold? Of course, silver is never as expensive as gold per ounce, but say we normalize them in some sense, that the, that the probability of one of the random variables was greater than the other random variable. It's always, it's always the probability over whatever is defined in here. This defines a integration region A, and it's, um, and we need to, we need to interpret that, that argument as an integration of A. And it turns out here is the integration. This is Y is equal to X, right? Over here, X is greater than Y. Or is it the other way around? Here, x is equal to zero. No, y, no, that's, that's right. So over here, x is greater than y. Do you agree with that? And over here, x is less than y. 
So if we want to figure out the probability that X is greater than Y, then we need to integrate the density function over this interval A. Make sense? So this is the probability. Let, let's look at this. If you remember from calculus, I don't know, this calculus two or three, it's in integration, you, you uh, integrate from X is equal to Y, X is equal to Y to infinity. X is equal to Y to infinity, and then you integrate out the Y's. And this is the result that you get. So this tells us the probability that X is greater than or equal to Y. So this will tell us the probability of a random variable of the price of gold, price of silver is going to be greater than Y. Price of gold and price of silver isn't really a random variable that we can talk about because this underlying probability density function, I think, changes as a, as a function of time. But I, I hope it's something that we can all relate to. Um, let's look at the probability that the minimum of X and Y is le greater than Z. So we have the price of gold and we've had the price of silver. We want to make sure that neither one of them is greater than, I don't know, $50 an ounce or something. So what's the probability that the price of gold and the price of silver is greater than or greater than or equal to, uh, I don't know, $100 an ounce or something. That's what Z is. So we want to make sure that neither one of those or, or, or that uh, both of those are greater than Z. Well, again, it's the probability that uh, it's a probability that it's a probability over A. And then we have to take this argument here and figure out what this integration region A is. And so if you pick a specific value of Z, let's use Z here, then all of this area here is the minimum of X and Y, and all of that is greater than Z. So that how, that's how this argument translates to the integration that we need to do in the probability plane. The probability that the minimum of X and Y is greater than Z. So we have to integrate the probability density function over this region. So it's the integral from Y is equal to Z, uh, Y is equal to Z to infinity, y is equal to z to infinity. And then x is equal to z to infinity going this way. And that's going to give us the overall area under A, which is the probability that the minimum of x and y is greater than z. So you can see this two-dimensional idea of a probability density function allows us to do many, many great and wonderful things. So I think this is probably a good place to start, to stop, to start. <laughs> this is a good place to start next time. Uh, before we do that, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. I have one. Um, whenever we're doing uh, these two, uh, two variables, random variables, I think you mentioned this at the beginning, but whenever we have two random variables and we want to do this kind of 3D uh, or two dimensional probability density function, we have to have both the variables be independent of each other. Is that correct? Because no, no, no. In fact, like... in fact, it's very boring if they're independent of each other. If they're very, in, if they're independent of each other, then the joint is the product of the marginals. Uh, I see. Okay. So we would so, actually like it. For them. Yeah. The okay. reason it's the reason that that's boring is because you don't need the two-dimensional density function. All you need is the one-dimensional function for X, the one-dimensional function for Y, and then you just multiply them together in the histogram. Yeah, okay, that, that so makes that, that's, sense. So that's, that's very boring. And you don't okay. need the two-dimensional histogram. You, you can deal with them just as one-dimensional random variables. Yeah, the most interesting portion is when they are, um, when, when they are dependent on each other. Now we'll find okay. out later, and this is because people in statistics like to do, that there's something which is similar to independent, it's called uncorrelated. 
And you've probably heard of the concept of correlated and, and uncorrelated. And it turns out if you were to look at a thesaurus that uncorrelated would be a synonym of independent, right? They're both trying to say that one has to do nothing with the other one, right? If they're independent or uncorrelated, one has to do nothing with the other. In probability, they mean very different things. And uncorrelated is a much weaker sort of, uh, sort of relationship between random variables than is dependence. And we will get to that uh, very shortly. But both of them are trying to say that one random variable has nothing to do with the other one in some sense. So uncorrelated is a weaker way of, of saying that they have nothing to do with each other. We'll find out that anything that's independent is uncorrelated, but things which are uncorrelated need not be independent. Okay. Uh, so anyway, if that's confusing for you, just stay tuned and it will become unconfusing as we get into stochastic processes and stuff. Okay, any other questions? Good question. Thank you, Theo. Okay, then be prepared with the homework next time. And uh, until then, be of good cheer and uh, don't swallow any armchairs or whatever. <laughs> but, but, but I have no idea what that means. Bye-bye. <laughs>